So, uh, really nice, to, <laughs> really nice to meet you, Carmen. <laughs> we 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 had a little chat before the the show started as well. I'm really intrigued to have this conversation because I've lived in so many different countries myself, uh, and as a polyglot, I understand how important it is to you know there's a massive difference between knowing a language of a culture or not to really dive into it, to really get access, the, the secret handshake, you know, uh, <laughs> or not. So it's so inspiring to have this conversation with you uh, as a person who has the secret handshake of the Italian culture. Now, I don't know this handshake, and be, but maybe you can share this with us. Uh, well, today. we do talk with our hands, so that helps a little bit. But yeah, I definitely know a little more having such a good good grasp on the language. Um, and I don't speak more than um, just Italian and English. Uh, I do understand some other language and I'm other languages and I'm trying to learn um, Spanish and French a little bit on Speakly, actually. I'm fluent in Italian and English, so. Um, but I, because I'm fluent in just two languages, I almost feel like I've been able to dive fully into Italian yeah. and the Italian culture that much more, um, since my focus is just here in Italy. Uh, and I do, I always tell people when they're traveling here, even if it's just for a short time to learn Italian, learn phrases, learn words, just, you know, please, thank you, um, how to order a dish because it just adds a new layer of um, just beauty and sort of authenticity yeah. to experiencing Italy yeah. and the people. It really intrigues me because like, I just had uh, a conversation with some French people um, a few days ago uh, via Skype. And uh, it was the funniest thing. Like I started thinking that it's so weird how people from different countries approach the way how you, you know, speak the local language. It was it, it was the funniest thing, and I've lived in Paris, and I've you know encountered this a lot with French language. Is that even if you're perfect in French, if somebody kind of sees a little tiny difference in your accent, they will switch to English because it wasn't you know 100% perfect. So I had the same situation. I had a, I had a conversation with uh, a few French people, and you know I speak French pretty fluently. I've translated novels from French. I've lived in Paris. And it's the funniest thing, they, you know, in the middle of uh, the call, they just asked, do you want to switch to, you know, English? It's like easier. <laughs> and I was thinking, wow, what, what a weird thing to say, you know, I'm just speaking quasi perfectly, your local language. Like, why are you saying that? That and and does is kind kind of like is this also true with Italian people or are they like, because I've experienced uh, stuff in Portugal that if you know one word they will be just they will invite you to your home you will have a night over you know it's just like it's so different so how is it with Italians you know it really depends where you are in Italy um, and it depends on you know even just the people you're interacting with um, overall I would say because of the massive amount of tourism here Italians are quicker to jump to English if they get any sense of you speaking English or being, you know, having English origins. Um, and I think that's just because of the amount of tourism here. And I've noticed when I travel to other countries, the same thing, even if I know a couple of words, if they are countries that experience, you know, less tourism, if I'm in a less touristic area, they're much more open to letting me speak their language and, you know, butcher it in a sense but um here in italy i would say if you go to a more touristy city like rome or florence or milan you'll experience more of that where they hear a little you know accent and switch to english immediately and then if you are you know discovering little hidden villages um places that are more untouched by tourism people are much more excited to speak to you in Italian and um, even if you have a bit of an accent they don't mind it and even if you can say a simple phrase they're just blown away by the fact that you're trying so I do think tourism has in my opinion an impact on that how is your Italian so is it like native 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 basically right 
So um, I can get by pretty well without people figuring out I'm American. Um, So I would say my accent's pretty good. (laughs) Um, But I actually majored in a language. So that played a big role in my fluency. Um, I would say I am completely fluent. Of course, I learn a new word here and there. Just I even learn new words in English sometimes. So that's normal. But um, yeah, living here and then majoring in the language in university um, made a big difference. So yeah. Yeah. So you, you've been living in Italy for seven years. That's a long time. You are from the States, obviously. Uh, and I will go back to the beginning. How do you ev- even end up in the you know other part of the world? Right. Um, yeah. So I moved here in 2014 and um, I'm coming up on seven years in June. And I initially moved here for love. I fell in love with an Italian man and just left my life in America. And it was very um, kind of storybook-esque. But, um, you know, love will transport you anywhere if it's a strong enough pull. And it pulled me to Italy. And then, um, you know, that ended up not lasting. But I fell in love with the culture and the people and the language and the lifestyle in the meantime. And I actually got my dual citizenship because I have Italian ancestry. And so I got that in 2018. And I was able to just start living and working here as a citizen and prior to that I was just here on a student visa so once I graduated I had that dual citizenship and now I'm able to stay here with that and I don't see myself ever leaving I just love life here too much but you know when you when you arrive to Italy 2014 is said what were kind of what are what are the main things that are just weird about culture it's just like because you weren't kind of you, you didn't know about that so much right because it, there is a massive difference between knowing and actually you know living it right yeah um well luckily i did experience italy a little bit before moving here i spent a couple of summers here with my family growing up um and the village my ex was from was actually a village my mom found in her 20s traveling through Italy and she just fell in love with it and decided to um, take my family to this village for a couple of summers Um, so I went there when I was five years old the first time which I don't remember um, just for a few days and then we spent six weeks there um, when I was 11 and another time when I was 16 and so moving here I was um, 19 years old I guess And so I had that prior experience, not fully like immersed in the life here, but having, you know, six weeks here was a good amount of time to really feel what the culture is like and the differences in the lifestyle a bit, even if I was on vacation. And that was the main difference. Once I moved here for some, you know, I didn't quite connect the dots that it wasn't going to be a vacation. You know, it's real life. All of a sudden you're dealing with real life stuff and um i was pretty naive and just didn't think about that so um it there were definitely some big cultural differences um i would say the first one is just the bluntness of the italian culture and i grew up in in the midwest in nebraska and we're very nice and very you know just if someone got a terrible haircut we will tell them it looks great And we just lie to people to keep it, you know, sunshine and rainbows. So um, coming to Italy, they're much more honest and just sort of unfiltered. And that was one of the things I realized, you know, was a little different than my home hometown in Nebraska. But um, I don't know. I've come to appreciate that bluntness a little more. And I've become more blunt. My family tells me I'm a little... um, yeah, shameless now <laughs> when I when I have, you know, just opinions. I'm not afraid to share them. So I'm not mean, but I've definitely picked up on some of that Italian unfiltredness. That sounds really Estonian, right? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm Estonian originally. So uh, this sounds exactly the way uh, how Estonians would function. Uh, just saying a few words and uh, as blunt as possible or whatever. Something, something like that. 
Anything else regarding uh, regarding uh, you know just how you integrate into a society? Like obviously you know there are some weird stereotypes going. Oh, uh, you you know, and people are talking about that everything you know in France, for example, that everything is done via the fax, ma uh, fax machine or whatever. Uh, that everything is so outdated. Uh, especially coming from a country like Estonia, like I, like I'm, like literally, nobody has a printer anymore. Like literally, like it's a, it's a, it's a thing that doesn't exist in uh, in, in people's use. Uh, did, was there kind of like a learning curve to get into the society for you as well? Um, you know, yeah, uh, the convenience and um, yeah, just ease of getting things done in the U.S. definitely isn't as present here even yeah printing i you know it's hard to find someone in italy with a printer uh usually you have to go to a shop and have it printed for you people don't just have printers in their homes unless they're you know businessmen who need printers but in italy in general having a printer is not a common household thing we also hang our laundry on the lines we don't have dryers um you know they make a lot of things from scratch they grow a lot of things in their gardens um it's a lot more hands-on i guess and it seems kind of old and outdated to an american who's just stepping in but for me that was one of the beautiful things about moving here just sort of stepping back and experiencing that simplicity of life here and i have a major appreciation for that i prefer that it just feels more natural than the quick fast pace let's get it all done right away let's dry our laundry in 20 minutes and I mean, I just love the slower pace of life here. So, um, yeah, that is a big difference. And it might be hard for people who prefer that convenience and fast, you know, pace. But I really have a love for the slower pace and the simple things. So I've, yeah, just fallen completely in love with that aspect of life here. So, so it helps you be more mindful as well, I imagine. It's like, it's... it's um... I don't know if this happens in the U.S. Like in Estonia, still, like where I live, like children go to the countryside. They also experience you know, the laundry being just just like on strings outside and just like weird weird stuff that you don't get in a modern society. And it's just like mindful, uh, right? And that that makes me think of a a friend of mine who has a YouTube channel actually, and uh, he makes videos about Italy as well uh a small youtube channel and he uh, is telling me that it's weird that when he made videos about uh, the kind of like the wonderful italian life or such then he got feedback that please don't miss like miss uh, kind of like you're representing us wrong because it's it's not only dolce vita and things like that it's it like like please please uh, the world please stop representing uh, us in such a way uh, we're just not only fare um, da niente, or you know, all these things that we we are just like laying about and being being uh, all chill about life. It's actually uh, much more than that, and it's it's the funniest thing, you know. People have those stereotypes uh, with Spain as well, for example, right? But when you look at data, actually, actual data, you will see that Spanish. I think I I might be wrong on that, but Spain is per capita. Uh, the most per person working w like working hours per day uh, country which is like s something you wouldn't even guess right it would be like sweden or something because like <laughs> like with snow and nothing else to do but i think i'm not wrong on this i, I just read it on somewhere uh, so probably it's the same thing with italy as well right it, it's kind of unnerving that you are seen as a country that's only um you know dolce vita you know it's um this is such a i feel like i could talk for an hour about this because i have so many opinions on it but um it's true that you know there are a lot of italians who work very hard and are not experiencing you know when i was living in monterosso um uh, i lived there for three years from uh, after i graduated 2017 till um, yeah, the end of 2019. So, um, anyways, when I was living there, I was a waitress. I was, um, a house cleaner. I, I helped clean rooms for an Airbnb. I was an Airbnb host. 
I was working from sun up to sundown. I never saw the sun. I was like the whitest person in Italy. <laughs> and, um, you know, I would meet people just who were so um, inspired by Italy and our lifestyle here and told me I was living the dream and how lucky I was. And of course I felt that, but I also was like, well, yeah, it's really cool, but I'm, I don't even see the sea for two weeks sometimes because I'm just running around like crazy trying to work. And that lifestyle, you know, at a certain point, I just realized I couldn't do it anymore. And a lot of people don't have the choice and they have, you know, family businesses and, they have to kind of submit to that lifestyle and um, find a way to make it work for them. And I think those are the Italians that um, might get angry when people think it's just laid back and relaxed and chill. And But luckily now I work for myself and I've found a wonderful balance of work life and the Dolce Vita. And I feel like I'm experiencing the Italy and the lifestyle that people imagine when they think of moving to Italy and, you know, the eat, pray, love sort of thing. Um, I think I'm closer to that now than I've ever been. And it took me, you know, almost seven years to get here, but it is possible. And especially for an expat, obviously being born into a family business here, you're sort of obligated to carry that on. But I had the freedom to go my own way here and I've found a really wonderful life here. So I do think it's possible to have Yeah, that. for sure, for sure. And and also the eat, pray, loves of the world, you know, they just, uh, I, I love this actually. It's one of my, you know, I'm a 35 year old guy. It's my favorite movie, I think. Uh, it's <laughs> it's like, you know, um, it, it's, it's so cool how these movies kind of help you be mindful as well. Because if after watching this movie, if you go to Italy, you won't just you know, finish a pasta in a minute and then just you start running in a different direction. You will, you know, you will have this mindful moment of no, 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 no. It's a pasta, I'm here. You know, I just need to take the time. Like every, every kind of taste is important. You know, like all these mindful things, right? Uh, that we don't usually uh, experience or we don't have the time for. Uh, there is a cool quote from Leonardo da Vinci, I think, or something that we only have, you know, experienced a fraction of the things during our days, and usually it's the neg- you know, the extremes, the negative extreme, the positive extreme, but no- nothing from the from the middle. And probably because of these eat, pray, loves of the world, it's uh, it's uh, more more so of a, a, a experiencing the whole palette. Yeah, definitely, I do think that's true, and. Um mindfulness and experiencing kind of um yeah that eat pray love having that eat pray love mentality no matter where you are in the world i think is important so you know living in italy i practice it even more because of all the beauty around me but i think you can find that no matter where you are yeah for sure for sure so so you know a few friends of mine who live in sweden for example they've been they told me that it's impossible you know as grown up it's it's difficult to find friends anyways a little bit more difficult than being a three year old right but uh in sweden it's impossible because people are so you know just so secluded or kind of uh, closed up uh how, what's the deal in italy is it like just two weeks later you had a community to communicate with or Or how is it? So um, my experience was a little different maybe because when I moved here, I I was studying in Florence um, at a university, but I would spend my weekends in Monterosso, this small village of 1500 people. Um, And so that's kind of where I was trying to make my friends because the weekends were when I had time to do that. Um, When I was in Florence, I was just studying, getting my classes done. So when I was in Monterosso, I was trying to form some sort of a social group. And I found it very difficult because when you enter a small town as a foreigner, they already have their kind of groups and the people they talk to and, you know, they all know everybody's history and where they came from and um they kind of are very uh, i found it very hard to integrate in a smaller town um and maybe that has to do with which town i was in um monterosa is a lovely town and there are a lot of lovely people in the town but i just felt like i couldn't really find my people as easily because of that small town sort of camaraderie of 
Um, we're all sticking together. We grew up together. We went to school together. We trust each other. And then I'm kind of this um, fish out of water there that they didn't really know anything about. And, um, you know, I could go have drinks with people, but it was hard to really get close and have them open up to me because they have, you know, um, it's harder for them to just trust and open up coming from this small town. Whereas in bigger cities, I found they're much more open and, you know, they'll share everything with you and they don't have this fear of, you know, being seen with someone because it's a small town. And I mean, it's just kind of a different environment overall. And um, yeah, and I was also really young when I moved to Monterroso. So I wasn't in the headspace to go out and put myself out there and, you know, try to make friends with everyone. I was much more reserved and... um, I'm sure that played a role as well. I had, yeah, my personality probably. <laughs> I was just more shy, so. Yeah, for sure. So uh, what would you say, what what are some of the cultural no-nos that you have been guilty of uh, after moving to Italy that, you know, any you know anyone listening and watching this would need to take into account for sure? Um, all right, so... Um, the first one is, uh, it has to do with dining in restaurants. Something a lot of Americans do is they pour olive oil and vinegar on the plate at the restaurant and then they dip their bread in it. In Italy, that is so frowned upon and they're so confused by it. Um, because, you know, oil and vinegar are very precious to Italians. Their oil usually comes from family, family vineyards Their vinegar is locally sourced and it's like gold for them. They're just so um, offended if someone just, you know, pours a bunch on a plate, like makes a soup out of it and dips their bread in it. Um, And also because Italians really um, obviously care about food and the meal and the dishes they're preparing. And if you're filling yourself up with bread and vinegar before the meal, then you don't have room to really enjoy the actual dishes as much so um yeah that's a thing i just thought was italian because in america we go to italian restaurants and that's the first thing they bring us and in italy you know it's just not a part of the culture and that's something we sort of um created i guess outside of italy i know in australia they do it as well i'm i'm sure other countries maybe but for some reason that was created as a thing that they do but they don't that is definitely not something you should do if you want um to seem like a local and like you know the culture here yeah so it's not even a thing so there is no you know there is no other way of doing that it's just like a no no it's just just not a thing that you do you wait for your food and then you start enjoying it right you wait for your food. If you're really hungry, you can just have a piece of dry bread, but you don't dip it in anything <laughs> or pour anything on it. That sounds counterintuitive. Like, you know, mm, something wrong with that. There's, you know, the best things in life, just like bread and just dipping it into oil. Like, why? I know it's so good. And don't tell anyone, but I do it sometimes when no one's looking. But <laughs> <laughs> I never, ever would do that in front of an Italian um yeah it's just not something they they do here and if you do it they'll you'll notice that they notice so like literally in the other table people will frown italians would yeah 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 um so yeah i that's definitely a number one tip i have for people it's a big no-no and um another thing is I mean, there is the rule with cappuccino. You're never supposed to order a cappuccino after 11 in the morning um, because Italians say it's bad for your stomach to have milk and coffee mixed together after 11. So if you order a cappuccino in the afternoon, they'll give it to you, but they'll look at you a little strange and probably make fun of you. (laughs) So there's this mystical time of the day, 11 o'clock, where your metabolism just changes into something that it doesn't mix anymore. Oh, I see. But one other difference for me being American was just understanding military time and the metric system here. Um, We use a different system in that we use the imperial system. So I'm still trying to understand that seven years later. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's huge. The environment you're in and getting out of your comfort zone definitely pushes you more to face parts of yourself that you otherwise wouldn't. And 
sort of diving into the unknown and experiencing so many things you've never ever even imagined you know you could experience it plays a massive role in sort of waking up parts of you that have been dormant or otherwise would never have to be woken up so um yeah that's massive i think just kind of experiencing that discomfort and navigating it it i mean i expanded as a person a living abroad actually kind of kind of enhances me in a way that wouldn't um, happen in the usual environment. And it's it, you know sometimes I've ever felt that when I start speaking in French or German or Spanish, I'm a different person. It's the weirdest thing ever. Like, have you felt have you felt that with Italian? Oh yeah, um, I definitely feel like um... I'm a more expressive version of myself when I speak Italian. <laughs> um, yeah. And then in, in American, I'm more of like a laid back sort of version of myself. Um, when I'm speaking Italian, in order to feel more authentic in how I'm speaking and how I'm expressing myself, I think I do kind of take on an Italian persona. And I don't know. Yeah, it's like I'm still me, but I'm the Italian me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I feel the same way. And it's uh, it's liberating in a way as well, uh, yeah. And there there is a there is a whole weird psychology behind that that it's liberating to wear a mask, you know, and stuff like that. But it's uh... and actually, I mean, I do tell like my I teach Italian online, and I tell my students to pretend to be like an Italian character in a movie or something. And then when I tell them that their accent is just ten times better and. Yeah they lose that sort of fear and discomfort and you know shyness and all of a sudden they're they're speaking italian and they're they have no reservations with it no inhibitions it's just here i am and so it's crazy how i think it's a mind a mind thing for sure yeah for sure one of the team members from speakly actually went to italy uh, to live there for you know for 3 months or so and she was telling me that uh, the pronunciation is so difficult. She's an Estonian as well. And I was saying exactly the same thing, that go to the max level where you actually feel ridiculous and then you are at the right place and then start speaking from that place. It's so true. Yeah. Every time I get told like, wow, your accent's amazing. It's in these moments when I'm just, you know, I feel ridiculous, but it's the most like authentic expression of the language. For sure. So coming to, coming to the language a little bit as well, how did you study it? Like, what did you do? Uh, the people watching would, you know, or, are all learning some languages, some of them Italian as well. And uh, they would like to have your best tips and tricks for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have my brain works in a very interesting way because I can't just read something and remember it. I have to create some strange trick to to remember. So. Um, a big thing I did was note cards and, um, you know, that was like just memorization stuff. But on the note cards, like, let's say there's a verb that I needed to learn. Let's say the verb cantare, which means to sing. Um, within that Italian verb, I would find an English word. So the word can't is part of cantare. So I would write on my note card, okay, I can't sing. And then I would remember cantare means to sing because I would see the English word within the Italian verb and my brain would make the connection. So that was just one of my tricks I used. And that's how I memorized hundreds of Italian verbs that way. And it, yeah, it's kind of just a funny, interesting kind of way that I found on my own to memorize things because I had... Did you read about it somewhere or did you, is it just something that your mind kind of, you stumbled upon yourself? My mind just did that. I was sort of desperate to start memorizing things because I realized how much memorization plays in learning a language. And if I connected those dots for some reason, I never forgot anything. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, it's, uh, you probably know about those, those more deeply uh, and uh, you, you support uh, your uh, learners with them as well. But it's uh, mnemonic techniques, right? And it's actually a very, they're called mnemonic techniques and they are so efficient, like based on studies. And the funniest thing why they work is that, you know, our brain actually doesn't want new information because new information, especially if it feels that it doesn't help you survive, takes energy because it's, you know, brain plasticity, it takes change. 
So you need to trick it in a way that, so, so and you know, the question is how my brain dis distinguishes between what is important for me and what, and what isn't. And there is this weirdest thing that it will look at, do I, does the new piece of information that I have link with something that I already know? And if it does, that's the signal that I will memorize, you know, I will just have this, I will acquire this piece of information. And if it doesn't find these points, then it will go out literally from the other ear. So the coolest thing, you know, what you were, you know, explaining here is, is the basis of a mnemonic technique of how to trick your brain. Um, I use this all the time as well. You know, the, the coolest thing is even if you can do such things that you take a foreign word and you slice it up to different words in that foreign language. For example, Spanish pantalones, so pan is bread, talon is a heel, and es is, is, es is a language abbreviation, right? So you imagine some, you imagine some person carrying a big loaf of bread, uh, walking on their heels very weirdly, in a weird way, and having some pan, and having some pants with, uh, you know, looking like, an, uh, like a Spanish flag with a symbol ES on them. And you're like, what is that? Oh yeah, but, and you're actually learning four words at the same time, which is, you know, that's, that's kind of like the ex expert version of the same thing, uh, which is very cool. cool. How interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize the whole, all the, you know, brain um, connections there were there. I just knew that's what worked for me. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and people might ask, like, why don't we have brains that just remember everything? Uh, that would be nice as well, but so inefficient, you know, it would take so much energy. So we need to trick our brains to go past this little test that it's doing to us, uh, in a way. Uh, so uh, it's, it's so cool that you said that you are using this in a nonchalant way like that, you know, uh, because memory techniques might sound weird and difficult to people, but it's actually a fun thing, you know, it's just like, I'm looking at a word, is there something that I know that it re resembles of or that it sounds like, right? And just make the connection, it's so easy, and it becomes like a game, uh, probably for you as well, right? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure, and I mean, when I teach my students my tricks, it's they're just like, whoa, it's so easy and so fun. And they're just blown away by how quickly they can learn it. And there's no effort. It's just, it just happens so naturally. So yeah, it is like a game. It's, it's a lot of fun. And it's fun to see how much you can learn through that sort of connecting, naturally connecting things. So you would say that that was your main trick in learning Italian, like just just tackling new vocab vocabulary in such a way and then starting to use it in the environment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, you know, once I had all, everything memorized and phrases memorized and then I could go out and, and use them in the real world um, and they sort of all just fell together as I experienced life here in Italy. Obviously living in Italy played a big role in my fluency, being able to use it on a daily basis and being surrounded by the language. Um, itself, but my tricks helped a lot with just getting the grammar down and being able to speak Italian properly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this is so useful for everybody listening. So um, just just start using these tricks. It's so easy and more you use it, the easier it becomes, uh, for sure. Uh, so talking about uh, the places well, you know, if somebody's looking at this, uh, you know, watching this uh, podcast and being like, yeah, I will now leave my uh, life behind uh, and go to Italy next week. The, por the borders are closed, so they, it's not possible. But, uh, but soon, then uh, where would you, uh, you know, it's so difficult to make those decisions. I'm making this decision myself at the moment, like where to go from autumn to go to in Portugal or in Spain, just like looking at places, you know, what are the pros and cons? What would you say are the, like based on your experience, best places in Italy to live uh, uh, at? Well, um, I've lived in three places. I've lived in Florence or Firenze for three years. I lived in Monterosso for three years and I've lived in La Spezia now for a year. And so Florence is the bigger city life, um, you know, not on the water, but very beautiful, lots of history. Monterosso is on the sea, lots of hiking trails, but very small. 
And then La Spezia, where I am now, is a bigger city, still on the sea, lots of access to nature and hiking trails, but much more convenience and a bigger pond, I guess, to live in. So um, those are just the three cities I've experienced living in. And of all of those, I have to say La Spezia has been the best for me personally because I just needed a bigger kind of city, but not overwhelmingly big. Um, Like a city like Rome or Milan might be really big for someone who's just moving here. Um, But I do think within a city you can find your people, your neighborhood, your spots you frequent. Um, So for me, La Spezia is the best hands down. I don't see myself leaving here anytime soon. Um, but I think it really depends what you're looking for. If you want mountains and, you know, rolling green, um, you know, you could go to the Dolomites in Northern Italy. If you want, um, you know, olive groves and vineyards and rolling green hills, um, but more just kind of countryside, you could go to Tuscany. Uh, if you want the seaside, Liguria or Southern Italy, Um, I would say for someone first moving here, Northern Italy might be better just because things work a little, I don't know, um, there's just, I don't know, it's more convenient in some ways. There are more trains, more organization, and Southern Italy is more chill. You need a car to get around. Um, They speak a lot of dialect, and so it's harder to communicate down there, whereas in the North, everyone speaks There are still dialects, but everyone speaks the common Italian language. And um, yeah, I guess I would say northern um, or even, you know, the Tuscany area, um, middle of Italy would be best. But as far as my personal experience, I found La Spezia to be a really nice size, although there aren't a lot of expats here. Um, And there are groups, I tell people, who are asking me to... Uh, where should I move in Italy to join a group on Facebook? Um, it's called Americans Living in Italy. And you can say, you know, I'm looking for this, not too big, not too small. You know, I'm interested in this. And people will tell you exactly what cities they think you should, you know, check out. So that helps to talk to people who are actually living here. Um, so, yeah, I think there are resources for that for sure. But personally, um you know it really it just depends on your personal preference and i've found las betsia to be the perfect balance for me so you uh, so you as a uh as a uh basically like an italian now right uh what would you say yes or no pizza with pineapple no no <laughs> no <laughs> so pizza with kiwi kiwi fruit cider right <laughs> No, no, no. Nothing, no fruit on pizza. (laughs) It's delicious, by the way. I never liked it, you know? (laughs) Even growing up, people would try to give me pizza with pineapple in the U.S., and I always hated it, and I guess it's because I'm a true Italian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like that from the beginning. That that's cool. So, what's your what are your favorite foods as a as a true as a true native Italian? As a true native, um, I also minored in cooking, so. I'd, I'd say my opinion counts a little extra for that. Um, but I love uh, risotto, which is just like a, it's similar to paella in Spain. Um, but the risotto ai frutti di mare, which is like a mixed seafood risotto, is amazing here. I We have a lot of seafood in Liguria, so all of our seafood dishes are amazing, but that's my favorite. And um, spaghetti al pesto, which is spaghetti with pesto sauce. I mean, our pesto sauce is the best in the world here in Liguria. So, of course, that's one of my favorite dishes, too. And, um, of course, the cheeses here are incredible. My favorite are parmigiano and burrata. So, those are parmigiano, parmesan, um, as Americans call it. And then burrata is like a mozzarella cheese, but it's not fully set. And so, when you cut it open, it's like creamy and amazing. So I'm a white wine person all the way because we are famous for our white wine in Liguria and I I just love the freshness of a cold glass of white wine. Um, but my favorite is um, are the white wines from Colli di Luni, which is a, an area above La Spezia. And there is this cantina called Lunai and it's amazing. The, Lunai. 
L-U-N-A-E, I believe. So um, their wine is incredible and they have this wine with a black label called Etiqueta Nera, which means black label. And it won like the best wine in the world, I think in 2018. And so, yeah, it's a pretty good wine and it's my favorite. That's cool. Uh, so basically, I think we can wrap up, uh, we can wrap up as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all this, uh, you know, inspiration. I think people are going to watch this now and uh, will just uh, move to Italy uh, to a medium-sized town, not too medium big. Medium-sized town where they don't know what pants you bought yesterday <laughs> and they don't know what you ate for breakfast today. Um, second, you should be curious, ask a lot of questions, ask people where they're from, you know, what their favorite restaurant is and just sort of be yeah inquire a lot um because yeah that just will help you make friends easily and um learn a lot about the area you're visiting and another thing to be more italian you have to dress well of course oh yeah i don't have that so lots of lots of improvements to, to do uh, so just like uh, on a regular day just everything's top notch does it have to be? Does it have to be like fall, winter, spring, like collection stuff, or like good old, good old? You can you can reuse things from last season, but just um, <laughs> be creative with it. To keep it fresh. <laughs> keep it fresh. Okay. Thanks everybody for watching. I uh, hopefully this was super inspiring for you to study Italian and also to discover the culture. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Caroline.